Hello there, this is John Coleshaw, and I'm just slightly borrowing the voice of John Perkins for a moment. I don't know, maybe a regeneration might happen. Yes, it happened there. Yes. And you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. Wonderful chaps. Both of them. You are now travelling through time and space. Good day, audiophiles, and welcome to the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. My name's Dwayne, and my co-host Philip will be joining us very shortly. Today, we're joined by Yasmin Bannerman, who first came to the attention of Doctor Who fans when she appeared in the second episode of the 2005 revived series as Jay, alongside Christopher Eccleston. Before that, she'd appeared in Red Dwarf, and since... She's appeared in Torchwood on television and in various roles for Big Finish, including 7th Doctor companion Roz and Dana in Blake 7. Her first role for Big Finish was in the 2008 story The Bride of Peladon, featuring Peter Davison as the 5th Doctor. Here's a trailer for that story, and we'll be right back with Yasmin after this. Great Agador, dark beast of our ancestors. Hear my words, I pray. From out of the mists of legend, a man has returned to help us. Doctor, what was that? Whatever it was, it didn't sound good. Shh, shh, shh. This is Ambassador Six Slayer. My ship has been attacked. Require urgent assistance. The Doctor has always been a friend to Peladon. I don't doubt it, but history teaches us that death travels with the Doctor. I need manual control, and I need it now. If he resists the rest, kill him. Everyone, strap yourselves down. We're going to crash, Doctor! Soon we will meet. Soon you will face your destiny. It's my great pleasure today to uh, welcome our special guest. I'm all the way from Berlin, Germany, Yasmin Bannerman. Thank you, Yasmin, for joining us. Hello, hello. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, we are thrilled to have you. Um, you you're, <laughs> you're one of those special people who made a transition from the uh, the show first and then into audios. Um, and you've had a huge, huge contribution. So I look forward to hearing about some of that. But can you just tell us a little bit, little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and maybe how did you get into acting? So um, I was born in London, but grew up in Gloucestershire um, and, uh, and then came back to London um, when I uh, uh, began my studies, um, went to uni and began my studies um, at drama school. And um, yeah, and that's, I kind of got into acting uh, in the childhood ways where you have to go to school and there are plays and that sort of thing and after school clubs that sort of thing so I always had an an interest in performing which was fostered fortunately for me by my school um and um, and so that's how I sort of you know had it as an interest and then decided with the whole sort of A-levels what I'm going to do with my life um, encouraged by my father to actually go to drama school, really pursue it and um, and think about making it a profession. So that's really how I ended up acting. It's great you're encouraged by your father. Often parents don't encourage mm. their children to become actors. Um, what, what did yeah. your parents what did your parents do? Um, well, my father um, was um, in property and business. And uh, my mother's midwife. Um, and I must admit, I did think when I was sort of 18 and I was doing the usual plays and I'd done National Youth Theatre and I, and I was performing out of school as a sort of hobby kind of 
uh, way. I had thought I needed to do something practical, like become a teacher. Um, so I was just thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to need to get my maths for this because, oh my goodness, I'm spectacularly awful at maths. Um, and um, um, I thought, I was thinking practically that would be a sensible thing to do. I never really thought seriously about going into acting just because there were so few um, role models um, in terms of black actors. It just, to me, it just didn't seem, I just never considered it. And it was actually my father who said, wait a second, this is this thing that you love to do. Why are you not thinking about pursuing that? And I just thought, oh, that just sounds like craziness to me. And he said, I remember him saying, listen, whatever you choose to do, you have to get up every morning at whatever o'clock um, and you've got to go and do that all day and come home, day in, day out, year in, year out. So pick something you love. Don't look at the limitations. Pick the thing you love and aim for that. And, um, and that's what made me decide to go and audition for drama schools and, 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 you know, and really go after it. I never thought about it that way before. And um, yeah, that kind of changed the trajectory of my life. So what was it about acting that you loved? I think it's a strange thing. I was born shy. And I, I'm sure a lot of people will take issue with that and say, no one's born shy. Um, but I was. From my earliest days, I can remember being very, very shy and introverted. And I can still, I still have this early memory of this uncle of mine, Uncle Bra, who's such a sweetheart. And he used to have all the children around him in the circle. And he'd play with us and do little games with us. And he used to say, come on, Yasmin, do your dance. I literally stand there and bend my knees three times. That's all I did with my head down. And then he'd be like, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure that that comes into it somewhere this kind of thing this this little performance thing that I liked to do and and, and made me feel a bit happy but then especially starting at school we had choir which I love to do I love to sing and I was one of those people like many people you sing and nobody hears you and sort of being encouraged in all of that and, you know, stepping into performance and it not needing to be me and my shy self, being able to take on a persona or just perform the material and step out of myself. I just loved it. I just loved it. It just brought something out of me that um, was blissful and wonderful and creative and oh, just gorgeous. And I just wanted to live in that experience um, all the time or as much as, as possible. And, and, and in that way, I was very, very lucky. Um, I, I know things, I've heard things are changing in the UK, sadly now, um, in terms of funding for the arts. And that's also starting in schools. But when I was at school, uh, the school that I went to, things like sports and um, and art and drama were very, very much fostered and encouraged. So there were so many opportunities to just have a go and be part of something. And it was wonderful. And I'm so grateful for that. I never really appreciated it until now, but you never know you, what you've got till it's gone in, in a sense. And then I, I think all of those things, um, having a school that gave everyone the opportunity to shine at something um, has, has been a, a amazing. And that I, I'm sure that that's made and informed what I went on to do um, greatly. Can I just pick up on something that you mentioned earlier that you, you said that it was difficult to find uh, black role models in acting. Mm -hmm. um, one actor that I want to pick up on is uh, Josette Simon. Had she oh. crossed your path or, or had she come to your attention during your years growing up? Had you noticed her? She was my hero. Absolutely. Absolutely. At the time, when I was growing up, racism was kind of family friendly. <laughs> we had the most racist shows that were like family viewing. 
Um, and I would dread going into school uh, the next day and then and, and hearing these sort of horrible, racist, funny jokes that people would want to try out on me from that Saturday night's entertainment. And you, there were very, very few um, black actors. There was just no, there was so little representation. And so, oh my goodness, even if there was a little, even if it was two seconds, even if it was a tiny part on a show that mattered, it was all so incredibly valued and, um, and, and we wanted it and needed it and, and, and cried out for it. So when Josette Simon was in Blake Seven, it was a revelation. It was incredible. Just being there at all was huge. And then on top of that, she played this kick ass character that was just so unbelievably cool. Even just for, um, forget about being black for a moment, just being a woman, that role. I mean, she was awesome. She was this um, munitions expert and she was fierce. She was so courageous and she was young and she was feisty and she was so smart. And she was a revelation. She was an absolute revelation. And then uh, especially um, looking to America, there was all black representation, but it was, a, it, it, you know, it was, it was all, almost also um, as, as acceptably black as one could get at the time. So very, very fair skinned and valuable and beautiful and black. And that was great. But Josette was also, she was dark like me, like a dark girl with short hair. She was like as un-European as you can get. And she was beautiful and she was amazing. And I just could not get over her. I couldn't get enough of her. And I got to see lots of her. She wouldn't just sort of walk through frame and kind of be there. She was there. She was like a main character and it was awesome it blew me away and I loved her I absolutely loved her we've, we've had both Sally Levette and Jan Chappell on, on our podcast and and both of them talk about the fact that they didn't feel that as female characters they got to progress very far it's amazing when just mm. set hit the screen in the third season she was just given so much strong strong work to do and just mm. carried carry off and she was I think she was only 20 21 at the time so it's a pretty amazing performance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, she was incredible. That was fantastic writing. I loved it. And, and so for a girl like me, it was quite pretty life-changing. How, how hard has it been then in terms of drama school? I mean, she's, she was the start of the model. As you say, I mean, the, the shows like Love Thy Neighbour and there was horrendously racist shows that she, yeah. at the time. Um, yeah. Just, just accepted. Um, yeah. And what do you feel? Like, has it changed? Have things changed now? I mean, they're getting better, or are they where they should be yet? How was drama school? How was your career in terms of being a black woman? Well, do you know what my expectations? My expectations were pretty low, just because of what I'd experienced. Because, of course, you know, growing up and and especially um, where I grew up. There, there weren't a lot of black people. It's changed now, but when I was growing up, there weren't a lot of black people around me. Um, in um, I was born in London, but we, but we moved very quickly out of London, which is very multicultural and always has been, um, to the countryside, effectively. Um, and so I encountered racism and plenty of it. So I wasn't expecting any it to be any different in my career. So. Um, I was actually very pleasantly surprised that um, I did not encounter a lot of racism in my career. And I know a lot of people that have and have been around them while they were, um, or at least heard their accounts. But I didn't actually have that experience. Now, it may be that I wasn't privy to many roles that I would have been knows but in terms of especially comparing myself with my friends who were um white and british or you know or at least white wherever they were from in the world um i didn't have a tough a time of it 
in terms of my career path and what I was being offered and the kind of roles I was being offered, um, I didn't actually experience that. I also didn't um, experience a lot of uh, terrible stereotypical roles that were hard to do. I was very, very fortunate in, in that sense. So I cannot complain about any, and I personally can't complain about it, but I know that there's a lot of it racism and sexism I, I i know that there's a lot of that yeah I was gonna say, has it been harder being a woman or harder being black in terms of roles for me personally i'd say probably being being a woman just in terms of what is written and i think things are a lot better now a lot better now because you know I'm an old bird and um, you know we're going back a, a, a long way in terms of what was on the table and I think that that has changed quite dramatically but probably in terms of what was being offered probably um, for me time being a woman was probably you know and 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 even within that you know I did quite well out of it in terms of what I was being offered so once you left drama school, what 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 was your sort of career path? I mean, the, the way I'm heading for Doctor Who naturally, but just just yeah. <laughs> what what were some of the things you did be, between drama school? Um, and... So when I first left drama school, I did the. I mean, the thing is, you just go up for everything, and so I think my very first job um, was a commercial. I think my very first job was a commercial for Alpen Cereal. Um, and um, and that nice, and um, and it's not usually that well paid. Um, so it was lovely having this commercial because back in the day you used to get such lovely things as repeat fees. <laughs> so you could actually live off your commercial for a while. So it was you know it was what I could get get at the time. I went up for a lot of auditions. I had a very good agent who's very encouraging. And so, yes, yeah, so it was commercials and theatre um, and, and that sort of thing. But very, very quickly, um, oh, it didn't feel like quickly, but, but not long after I got my first TV role, sort of major TV role on a show called Hollyoaks, which I believe is still going. Um, and um, it was, we were sort of the original cast for that show. It was all very new in, um, um, for Mercy Television. And um, so that's, that was the beginning of things. Now that's for about two years, wasn't you on that for? Yeah, yes, yeah, so that, was, that was for a couple of years. And on the very tail end of that, I had my son and, uh, and could was still in very much interested in acting but was sort of looking to spend more time with him and um not not running quite so hard after everything still ambitious but in a slightly different way but yeah so you did lots of different bits and pieces of television after that lots of different Tons. shows <laughs> like yeah your, your list is very big uh, um, <laughs> a bit so... of everything <laughs> but can, can i jump in there um, yeah. One one show that I uh, saw you in that I that I really loved is Red Dwarf. Do you have any memories uh, of, of uh, being there? I I think the season you were on, they weren't doing studio uh, recording uh, or live audience recordings anymore at that no, stage. I, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, yeah. I I wasn't even aware that they did. Um, I loved the show, and um, so I got it's a tiny little part. It's a blink and you'd miss me part, and um, it was if I remember rightly I think it was like a green screen type thing I was kind of sat on my own <laughs> so I didn't actually meet the cast and um which was yeah I was gonna because... say did you get to see Danny do the little dance that you were that you were supposedly watching <laughs> no I didn't get to see him do that and I knew Danny because I worked with Danny on my first professional play it was Playboy of the West Indies which we toured and um, and he was in that, so I knew him, but I didn't get to see him on the show. So you've done many parts, and of course, one of the parts that you're most famous for is being a tree. 
Um, yes. How, how do you end up playing Jabe uh, in the first, you know, the, the remake of Doctor Who in the, the second story? How, how did that part come along? Oh, my goodness. Well, like all the parts and for everything, whether it's a commercial or a voiceover or whatever, I mean, you, you, your agent just has auditions for you and you go up to them. And I remember going up for this Doctor Who thing and I thought, Doctor Who, yes, because I used to watch it when I was little, and I just remember my first Doctor was Tom Baker, and I was terrified of Doctor Who at, at that time when I was little. I remember my brother and I used to, I, my my brother used to sit on the sofa, and I used to stop behind the sofa because I was just waiting for the Daleks to come out, and they terrified me and then a few minutes would <laughs> a few minutes in my brother would be behind the sofa with me <laughs> watching um and I just thought oh wow it's that show and I just thought gosh no one's gonna watch that <laughs> it'll, ne- it'll never catch on this new generation nobody nobody I I wasn't aware of Doctor Who as something that people followed and that there were books about it and that it was this whole I, I didn't have that sense I just thought it was this old show that they wanted to remake but I mean you know I'm up for anything you know I I, I was never sort of it wasn't that I wasn't selective but um, in a way I wasn't because my agent was already selective so I just did everything that came up I, I auditioned I had a go um, so I remember um, I remember the audition. Um, and I remember getting the role and actually having a rehearsal because that's a very rare thing for TV, or at least it was for me. Um, we didn't usually have rehearsals and I actually had a rehearsal for, um, for, uh, the Doctor Who. And it was lovely because we also got to discuss it and it was Russell was there and, um, yeah, we just got to sort of discuss what was happening and and how how you know how I was seeing what was happening and what were the implications of what was happening. So all of that was very interesting. But um, I yeah, I do remember um, finding the whole thing interesting, but kind of bizarre, and thinking, yeah, no one's gonna really, yeah, <laughs> no one's gonna. No, no, one, watch this. <laughs> no one remembers it at all, do they? They never, never mentioned it anymore. <laughs> so, how, how long? I was make- right. <laughs> <laughs> how how long did it, did it take to put the makeup on and do all that sort of? Because you you were sort of the first person to have all those prosthetics and be a major cast. Yes. So you to you, have the work. you were you were the experiment. How 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 did it run on you? Yeah, that was just bizarre, actually. Because just rewind a little bit. Um, I saw some early sketches of what they were thinking about for my character. And what I saw was gorgeous dress and like a headpiece. I thought I'm going to be like a beautiful woodland princess. It's going to be fabulous. And um, and I remember going for the costume fitting. Yes, because my daughter was very little. She was something like 18 months and I got to go along and they were all so lovely. And I had my costume fitting. And um, it wasn't the costume as you see it. It's um, they sort of make it out of this kind of lovely white material as they're just kind of getting the shape of things. So all of that was going on. And I saw some preliminary sketches about what they were thinking about for my character. So when they mentioned prosthetics, I had no experience of prosthetics whatsoever and didn't really know anything about it. I was thinking, yes, mythical headdress thing, probably going to come out of my head. And I didn't, and the, the penny didn't drop even when they were saying, yes, are you going to come along and we're going to, we're going to take a, a mold of your face. And I was thinking, oh, this was very elaborate stuff for my headdress. And so I went along and they did do, they did the mold of my face. And it was several sitting. And then finally the big day, they said, that, you know, it's going to take us, you know, many hours to do this. Still didn't clock. And then, all these pieces that were coming onto my face and they, they were showing me and, you know, it all had to be glued on. And the whole process, the first time around, it took six hours. Six hours. Six hours. Oh, my goodness. And then when I, I'd finished, it was kind of like, da-da, see yourself. I was horrified. I'm like, I'm a monster. <laughs> Just wasn't what I was expecting, darling. I thought I was going to be beautiful. Um, <laughs> so, 
and six hours and um what what do you what do you what do you do for six hours sit chat <laughs> you really they were lovely and 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 so interesting and i had so many questions um but uh yeah it's long it's really long and um and each piece is, it's glued onto your face really it's the whole thing is sort of glued in bits onto your face it's not one mask or one piece it's lots of pieces the whole thing is and then afterwards it has to be removed now i know that they do self adhesive wallpaper now but back in the day and probably i'm still a bit sure they do i haven't wallpapered anywhere um since i was um little and had to help my mum who was the decorator but you have to take this stuff off with the with that what is that flat metallic thing that you have to the scrape the walls with and that's how you take off the, the prosthetics it's really like a, a solution it's like nail on this remover stuff and like the, this thing and you scrape it off and it takes forever so it took I think the first time it took six hours to put the whole lot on and then it took two hours to take the whole lot off and it's whoa it's intense and your skin doesn't love it it's not like a day at the spa <laughs> so how many days so. how many days how many days of filming do you need to put it on for how, you know how many days it was i'm trying to remember now i think the whole thing we shot in the end in two weeks i might have got that wrong but i think so and so and i think it was five days each week that that was happening it was yeah it so how, fa how, how fast did they get by the end? By the end, I think we got it down to five hours, four, four, four and a half, oh, five hours. Still a long time. In the end, and an hour and a half to take it off, I think, in the end. So that, that was how we, so, so of course, each day, even though it was two weeks, each day's filming starts very, very early for me, as you can imagine. Um, so yeah so I was half asleep in the makeup chair while they began which was fine by me because at home I had little ones I was used to early starts and here I got coffee and people fussing over I just had to sit there and close my eyes so I didn't I didn't object everyone was sort of saying oh you know sorry it's really early and everything I was thinking no oh, this is this is great I don't have to do anything <laughs> so um but but yeah it, it it's a it's a full-on the, the mastery, the, the creativity that goes into every part of it is just awesome. And just to be, a, to be a part of it is incredible. Now you spent most of your time working closely with Chris Eccleston. I mean, the two of you had yeah. scene after scene and, and very powerful, important scenes for the, yeah. the show. Not, not, not that you understand much of it, but in terms of the, the whole folklore of what was to come afterwards was yeah in your scenes what was it like working yeah. with chris oh amazing he is the nicest man he's just so down to earth and funny and lovely i mean you, you just i didn't know what i, I was expecting because i you know i watched chris and it was just like oh my gosh it's christopher eccleston it's just like wow and he's just so humble and yeah just just really really lovely man i think um when we turned up for the read through he he bought me a little plant which was the cutest thing he bought me this little plant and he was just oh so nice such a lovely guy just really really beautiful to work with him it was lovely to watch him interact with everyone from the people who are doing the makeup to the extras. I mean, there were a lot of extras. We had a lot of really big scenes. We had the little children who were painted blue and, you know, and he was lovely to everybody and charming to everyone and interested in everyone, which was, which is always really, um, it's just beautiful to see. It, it, it really is, and it just makes for a really lovely environment where everyone is working together rather than here is the star, your your position is here. None of that. It was lovely. 
a very, very positive experience working with him. So a couple of years later, you got invited back to actually play a human in Torchwood. Um, do, you yes. much about, do you remember much about that? Oh my gosh, do I remember much about it? What I remember most about it, to be honest with you, was going on set into the incident room, I think it's called, because I was a police lady, and they have, um, like in a real, well, I, I've actually never been into a police station, into an incident room or whatever you call it, where they have the, the pictures of the victim and all the rest of it. But they had it set up, like a real thing with the pictures. And of course, what I'm looking at has to be actors and prosthetics, but it was horrific. It was horrific. I just, it was just so, oh, it was full on. I was fascinated and horrified at the same time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you've done a lot of television, you've done quite a bit of stage work. Have you done much, audio, have you done much audio work before Big Finish? Before Big Finish, had I done that? I'd done little bits, um, but I, I think they'd been mostly uh, like documentaries, voice, voicing documentary type things. I think, I think I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the sequence, um, but I think so. Um, I'd always loved radio, but I'd not had much opportunity to, to, to do it. Um, but I had done a couple of little bits, but not much at all. Big Finish was really um, the start of everything for me in that regard. So how, how did you come to work with Big Finish? How did that happen? It was another thing that just came up that I was offered. And I quickly realised that I was, I was for the reason why I was, because being on Doctor Who is, even though I only did one episode of Doctor Who, I played this one character in one episode, um, but it's a little bit like rep, where, um, which used to be a thing back in the day, and I, it probably still does exist in, in some small corners, but I don't hear about it so much anymore, where you're sort of part of a company and you work together on different projects. and. Um, I think it, that world is a little bit like that because um, Doctor Who segues very nicely into Big Finish and their productions and it's a very sort of fluid thing and I was invited along and I think the very first one I did, the very first was um, The Bride of Peladon, um, where I played yeah. The Bride of Peladon and um, it was with, um, I think it was Peter Davidson, that one, wasn't it? Um, it was, and yep. Jenny Agatha, yes, was. yeah, Philadelphia. That's right, and um, that that was the very, very first. And I was so excited. I just, it was to me, it was just a dream role, and I loved, I, I, I loved the story, and um, and I hadn't been along before. And I remember going off to Moat Studios where that one was recorded. This is the big finish. It's Moat or Soundhouse, I think, um, almost all of them. And um, it was such a lovely day. Um, it was, it's so relaxed because you don't have to jump into makeup. You don't have to learn your lines or anything. You sort of come along. It's a very sort of family laid back atmosphere. It's like something you would just want to do for fun. And, um, and I loved it. And Peter Davidson was my favorite doctor. Because when I was younger, I was just in love with him. <laughs> when I was little, I just loved him. I was like, oh, he was so dreamy in his, in his cricket whites. Oh, my goodness. So um, it was so lovely to work with him and such a wonderful script to work on. And um, I had a blast. And also there's Toby's amazing food. He's doing whatever, wherever I work, whatever set, it doesn't matter whether it's a movie or whatever, the food's kind of sort of, no offense, but pretty school dinner-ish, you know, like what? Um, and it was, it's gorgeous food. On top of everything, you get well fed. Ah, oh, lovely. Loved it. So it Loved wasn't long it. before you came back to work with Colin Baker in The Fourth Wall. Yes. Um, and the fourth wall is 
is the most famous of all of the big Finnish productions in my household because my daughter is obsessed with it and quotes from it on a regular basis. Right? So I've heard it so many times because I tend not to listen to things, that, anything that I'm in. I just don't watch or listen to anything. But my daughter kind of had that playing on the loop and every now and then she brings it out again just because she loves impersonating the portions and it's just such <laughs> a, it's just wonderful. And she often refers to it as well in her analysis of, because she loves to analyze text and also um, movies. Um, so yeah, the, she she comes back to the fourth wall quite a lot. So yeah, that was um, wonderful again to work on. So much fun and so funny. And at the end of the day, when you finish recording everything, and then they do, you do the, all the drop-in sounds that, um, that that need to be, and the crowd sounds, and all the rest of it, and um, they did a lot of the portion, the portions stuff at the end. And I just remember being in a booth, laughing, just laughing and laughing and laughing because it's just so hilarious and so brilliantly well done too. Doctor Who, the Fourth Wall. Crazy? Oh, something's interfering with the signal. Doctor, I feel weird. What? You're, you're fading out. Oh, now don't. Where am I? Not right away. Oi! Don't worry, I'm coming. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the very first episode of my new TV program, Laser. Hey, who comes up with your own stuff? I'm not leaving you. Go, get help. There he Go. goes. Kill him. Who are you? What an unusual machine. You're a spy and I'm calling security. I am not a spy. You know this man. He calls himself a doctor. Doctor, say. Oh, I know. The doctor's here. He could interfere with our plans. Follow them. Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. Okay, so um, having done a couple of, well, there were major parts, they then decided to cast you, um, some who I wasn't really familiar with, but people in Doctor Who folklore, uh, Roz Forrester. Um, yes. So how how do you how do you get cast as Roz? Do you know what the thinking was behind that? I don't even know. I had done so. I'd done these little different parts on various um, big Finnish productions. I don't think I'd actually done that many at that point. And it made, and it had been over time. You know, I did the Bride of Peladon, and and the next thing that I did when I did the Fourth Wall, that there was quite. A, there was quite some time between the two um, and I was off doing other things. And um, so when I was asked how I would feel about it, I was just so incredibly flattered. And yeah, I was, it was, it was a gift. It was such an absolute gift. And, and I think at the time as well, I just sort of got to this point where I was, very much less interested in doing anything in front of the screen. I loved, um, I loved radio and, you know, and voicing documentaries and that sort of thing. So, um, so I was very, very interested and very, very happy to do it and just felt so honoured to be asked. And I love working with The Big Finish. So, um, so yeah, it was a gift. It was an absolute gift from God to me. I was, I was very, very happy. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who, novel adaptation. Who's there? Good afternoon. Lovely weather. Looks like it might snow later. Cold fusion. Shall we explore? Life here is harsh. Resources are scarce. I thought they'd be civilized in the future. Target acquired. Thanks to the Scientifica, this planet was one of the most harmonious in the Empire. Yet they need a peacekeeping force. You found yourself in the middle of a serious security incident. You nearly collapsed. A time disturbance. It was like being caught in a hurricane. We wish to probe other dimensional states, to tap into dimensional energy. My friends and I have been on this planet for six weeks, trying to discover exactly why the Adjudicators are massing their forces here and what the Scientifica is working on. 
How can I help? That's a ray-shielded door. What's behind that? A recent arrival. Classified research. Heavy security for a science project. Someone here has been manipulating events ever since we arrived. I don't recognize this man. Oh. Hello, Adric. It's a big machine. It's got to be at least a kilometre high. Completely embedded in the rock. Hello there! Don't worry, I'm the doctor. No. No, you aren't. Chief scientist, something's moving in there. Uh, enhanced audio. What is it? What is it, Chief Scientist? Big finish. We love stories. So you've worked with four different doctors, um, mm. and you said that you were terrified of Tom Baker, but did you know that on this one you're on the cover with him? <laughs> so, you, so you are with him in a sense. <laughs> What made you step away from uh, the the wanting to work on the television screen? I do you know what I've always struggled with it a bit. Um, it's the one thing that I never really felt that com comfortable or confident at doing. I never sort of felt well equipped for it, and I just think over time, I, I think especially after having my children, I um I found it very hard because almost every project that I did involved being out of London and um, I found it increasingly hard especially after my daughter was born I found it increasingly hard to leave um, and go off and do things I found it began to find it really sort of almost traumatic the separation and um, and at the same time I just yeah my love for it just really started to wane and um, and I just enjoyed it a lot less. Um, and yeah, I just found that I was doing it because it's what you do, but not enjoying it. And I hope that I will enjoy it again and want to go back to doing it. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I was even thinking about just walking away from the whole thing, but which would have been a shame just because I do love performing and especially not in front of the camera. <laughs> So have you been doing anything on stage at all? Or are you just really just doing audio work now and then? Audio work, audio work. I haven't had the opportunity for stage work, and I do wonder whether that is something that I might actually like to do again. But I really have to think long and hard about that and step into that carefully because I loved the stage and I always felt more comfortable on stage than ever in front of the camera. I felt equipped to be on stage. I trained to be on stage and I'd done stage work since I was little whereas the camera was something very new I never really completely trusted it and I was used to playing characters and in front of the in front of the camera I was expected to be more like what I looked like to other people if that makes sense um, and I don't know I never really felt completely at ease or like I was doing what I felt I should be doing, if that makes sense. Um, yep. Whereas the stage is, you, you just to you get to live out this this piece, this world, this this story from start to finish. Not this is the first scene, and then we're going to jump to the end, and then we're going to do this bit in the middle, and whatever. Just be real, or real in a sense that the camera is going to perceive real. Um, I found the, the performance on, 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 on stage just so much more organic as this evolving thing that you could step into and live. And, and, and I guess it's a bit of a feeling that I had when I was little and would bob up and down. And my uncle would applaud. It was very much sort of like being in the moment of something and being able to step outside of myself. Whereas on, and on camera, I was constantly second guessing myself. Um, and so, yeah, I think that I would love to step back into that. I, I, I don't know if I'm quite brave enough to do it today, but I would definitely take pigeon steps towards that. I think that that could be really, yeah, I think that there, there, there could be something really beautiful there that I'd enjoy. So you, you like to play in the true sense of the word of what a play is, actually, you yeah. know? In a character, yeah. in a situation with people playing together. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
Yeah. And the same with singing. I mean, I just always loved that. I always loved being in a choir. I loved this thing that you would create together that was kind of outside of yourself and was sort of elevated and beautiful. And um, yeah, that really appeals to me. You did a number of stories as Ros Forrestar. That's taking a, a book character and bringing a book character to life. Did did you know much about the character? Did people explain the books? Did you read in the books? What, what, what did you do? Was it just what, what you were on the screen? Yeah, I didn't know anything about Ros. I had no idea because also I, I just didn't have any idea about the universe of Doctor Who outside of what I'd seen on television and I hadn't seen it all I hadn't even seen all of the doctors my for me it was from Tom Baker to you know Peter present Benson, day Tom doctor Baker. I didn't even have a frame of reference for going in the day um it even blew my mind that Wurzel Gummidge was once the doctor how could that be <laughs> <laughs> I loved words or gummage, by the way. Um, but um, <laughs> so I had no idea about the world itself and I'd never heard of Roz. So just before I was, um, I was, I, I had a little look on the internet and I was given a book. I can't remember which book it was, but I was given a book to have a little look. Um, and um, yeah. And, and I must admit when I first started off with her, I was, I felt like I almost wasn't sure. I was I still didn't have a handle on what she was meant to be like completely um but fortunately um i got to know her over time and through the different scripts and um yeah and through her relationships so i mean that was really interesting um but i had no clue about her beforehand i just never heard of her and i'd never heard of so many characters in the, in that universe and you got to play another Russell T. Davis script with damaged goods. So um Yes I did. Mm. And I can't even now I'm trying to remember what happened with damaged goods. Is that the one with the creature with the tentacle like Yes. Yeah. Coming out of the body. It's like after a while you do so many extraordinary scripts that you can't you, you can't remember one from another by title alone. Um but yes, it, uh, uh, from, from what I can recall, it was a bit of a wild ride. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, quite I think, an intense one. I think Ross has a lot more to do in some other scripts, but that was sort of the introduction of mm. you know a, a lot of character. Now we mentioned, talked about Josette Simon earlier, and you talked about her being one of your heroes. Yeah. Uh, um, of course, when Blake's have returned to Big Finish, uh, Josette has politely declined not to replay Dana. Um, she yeah. she she works for Big Finish. She's quite happy to work for Big Finish, but she, yeah. for whatever reason, and we're not quite sure why, has decided it's not a role she wants to return to. Um, which is strange. I think I think you're right. I think it was such a pivotal role for so many people, and yeah. hugely loved. But for whatever reason, she doesn't isn't happy with what happened back then. Um, yeah. What was it like stepping into the shoes of a character that you'd known from when you were a child? Wow. Well, firstly, I mean, I'd heard whispers that they were going, I, I think it was because I was being interviewed for something else. I was being interviewed for a Doctor Who, I believe. And they mentioned that, they said, oh, you know, because I didn't even really know all the things that Big Finish did. I didn't know that they did anything other than Doctor Who. I didn't know that they did all sorts of sci-fi. And I remember saying, oh, I wish they do, I, talking about, you know, my experience of sci-fi and the fact that, you know, I, you know I, I didn't watch a lot of sci-fi, but as a child I had, I'd been just obsessed or whilst reviewing it, I realised, because I loved all these things. And I mentioned Blake Seven. And I said, oh, it would be so amazing if they um, redid Blake Seven. And then I talked about how much I loved this character, Dana. And, um, and the person who was in me, I I think they said they're thinking about it, but Gisette's not sure that she will do it. I think that's what they said. And at the time I was like, no, she's got to do it. I want to, I want, I want her to reprise this role. I just love her as this character. And 
it was a long time after that that I was approached. And it, it, there were two things going on. One, I could not believe it. I was just like, this is just like my dream. This is my absolute dream. And on the other hand, I was like, I want to see Josette play Dana. <laughs> so it was a weird, a weird thing. Um, just the thought of stepping into a shoe, just like, but I, I kind of dismissed that pretty early on because I, I was thinking, do you know what? She is Dana for me. She is Dana for me. And will always be. So I'm not going to be her because I can't. I can't be her. Um, so I'm just going to take this character and bring to it what I see and what I feel organically. And, um, and hopefully that's going to be okay. And, and, and I, I, just, I just felt enormously um, grateful um i i was so grateful that they would trust me with this role at all and it was just like everything coming full circle it just felt like divine providence and i was just overwhelmed i i think it's incredible and that the the the, the main cast that the original cast were going to be there all these people that i just loved watching because i truly loved them all and um so did my brothers and we were just obsessed with this show. I mean, we were really obsessed with Blake Seven, really and truly loyal fans. We watched it from the first episode to the last. I remember, I can even still remember thinking, well, where's Blake? <laughs> How can they do this without Blake? But um, uh, I, I, was, I was just, it was just an enormous privilege and I was really touched and just overjoyed. To, to play this role, absolutely. And then when I came the first, the first day I recorded, and of course then the nerves kicked in, it was just like, oh, are the main cast not gonna be like, they're all made, they did this, they lived this, and like, here am I. Um, and they were lovely. They were so lovely. They were so encouraging and generous and kind. And it was just like, my cup runneth over really one of the strengths of the recast was the fact that you actually do bring a very different dynamic and strength to dana that it's even scripted slightly differently but it's certainly later on it's your voice mm. and your tones that they're reaching for rather than to set simons um and i think it actually gives an integrity to the character because of yeah. the way you play it you. as you so mm. i think that's what's so successful Thank you, thank you. That's very, very kind of you. And I, I must say that I went, I've been to um, a, a couple of conventions, not a lot of conventions, and um, I did wonder how the fans were going to take it because, of course, she's beloved. I love her, um, and they were just incredibly kind and generous too, and appreciative, and that was lovely. I mean, to get their stamp of approval was just like, oh. Have you ever met just at Simon? No, I haven't. And I nearly did. And I was so glad that I didn't. Because here's the thing. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to string a sentence together in front of that woman. I just, I could not. She is just, oh, oh my goodness. I think she's just incredible. Like, I'm really uncool. And um, <laughs> I can still remember I was doing one episode and Hugh Fraser was coming along. Oh my goodness, to play this character. And it's great. He is the loveliest, loveliest man, but it was the first time I was going to be working with him. I'm obsessed with Faro. So when I came over to um, Berlin, especially, I mean, I just love all the Agatha Christie's anyway, and I always have since I was a child. And, um, and I loved Faro, and I loved him as Hastings in, in Poirot. And when I moved to Berlin the first time, I was so incredibly homesick. I just thought, what am I doing here? I hate it here. I miss London. I miss the British sense of humor. I miss everything. And so I watched um, the last present that I got from my father before he passed away was the box set of um, Poirot 
first episode till the last. And I watched it over and over and over again. And Hastings, I say, I just loved him. So here he was, he, he's playing this character, this, this baddie. Um, and I think at some point I went up to him and I had to tell him how much I just loved him playing Hastings. And I was just, I can't, you know, I blocked out exactly what I said because it was so cringeworthy. And he was just really charming and lovely about it. But I just know I was a mess. Um, so I'm really uncool. That's what I'm saying. So I do not want to be that uncool <laughs> in front of Josette Simon. I would probably end up saying, I love you. Um, so no, <laughs> I don't. I'm never going to meet her. And that's a good thing. We'll see. Maybe one day. Um, Hugh, Hugh, <laughs> Hugh Fraser, certainly, when they um, decided to cast the president of the Federation, of course, you know, never, never in the TV show. I mean, you couldn't get a more magnificent voice, and just yeah, oh. it, it just yeah, the perfect voice, perfectly cold oh. and evil, and yet charming. Yes, exactly, exactly, beautiful. Yeah, we've seen Paul Darrow and Jacqueline Pierce towards the end. Um, both of them, you know, got quite sick towards the end. Um, but yet determined to keep working for the sake of the fans. Yeah. Um, what was it like working with two iconic people? Well, here's the thing. I never actually worked with Paul face right. to face. He was he was sick and he but he was um, and he, even when he wasn't doing too badly, he was elsewhere in the country. So all of his stuff was recorded at his studios. And um, at one point we. Um, I believe we took a trip to Milton Keynes to a studio there so that we could actually record to him, with him as a cast. But he then got sick at the last minute and couldn't come. So I actually never met him. Right. I never met him, even though it was over such a long period of time. I never actually met him face to face. So you had some, um, great, you had some great scenes with him. How do you manage yeah. to, how do you perform a scene with someone who's not there? Um, the, the stuff is, is pre-recorded. Or um, the director or another actor reads in his lines and then they're picked up when they record with him. So, yeah, I did a lot with him, but never actually in the same room. So I never met him. And with Jacqueline, I did. I met Jacqueline. I think it, it feels like I worked with her a lot, but I think in total I met her about three times. We had long recording days and um, I remember the first time we were recording together and um, she was, it wasn't known that she um, had cancer. Um, I think at the time it was just assumed that, you know, she was just getting on a bit and, you know, the days are long and it was just a little bit too much for her. But she was an absolute trooper. And she's so incredibly glamorous in the most wonderful old Hollywood style. She came in and she had on this sort of, this thick sort of black robe, sort of dressing gown type thing. And it was just so darling, I'm ready for my close up. I loved it. She's well, she just, wow. She's, she walks into the room and all eyes are on her. She's just got this presence. It's, it's just, it was incredible. And she was very funny. She's got a very naughty sense of humour. And she loved to laugh. And it was an absolute pleasure to meet her and to work with her. She, she was just, wow, really just old school movie star. I mean, apparently for the last couple of years, she only wore dress, dressing gowns. So yeah. she she just bought elaborate dressing gowns with yeah. the pajamas underneath because her view was, well, what's the bother point of getting dressed? Were well, you just going to take it off again later? Yeah, but so. she wore it like it was a ball gown. I mean, she wore it. It was the coolest thing. I wanted one of those dressing gowns. I mean, it just looked like the height of glamour and sophistication. It was just like, ah, oh. yeah, it was. Yeah. And she was amazing. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Blake Seven, The Spoils of War. So this is what freedom looks like. No, not freedom. This is anarchy. You may have to remind me of the difference. Oh, 
Why are we doing this, Dana? Jenna isn't here. She wasn't ever here. And this isn't our fight. Against the Federation? I thought I was joining a band of revolutionaries. Well, here it is. Your revolution villa. This is what Blake was working towards. And you, from the moment you threw your lot in with him. Attention, unauthorized intruders. This station is now under Federation control. What is it you hate so much about the Federation? Are you serious? I want to understand. It provides for its people, creates work, maintains law and order. At least, it did. There are better ways of doing that without using an iron fist. You can hear this, Kelly? I can hear you, yes. Get out of my head. I'm not in your head, you're in mine. Villa Restal. Yes? It's been far too long, my sweetness. <laughs> Hello, Kravis. Weapons ready. We don't know who or what might be waiting for us behind that door. Brace yourselves. You! I should have guessed. Big Finish. We love stories. Not exactly the white knight I'd imagined, but I suppose you'll have to do. So, I mean, you've done lots of Blake Sevens. We don't quite know what's going to happen with Dana necessarily. And they've started rebooting some of the Blake Seven IDs by doing unusual sideways journeys. Um, yeah. Have you, have you heard whether Dana's coming back for anything, or you're not sure? No, no, I haven't heard anything at all. I actually haven't heard anything since the um, since the pandemic. I mean, it's just like when the world just went kind of crazy. It was like the pandemic has been like an episode of Doctor Who. I think that's what's happening. We're all trapped in an episode of Doctor Who. <laughs> that's all. It's just like you couldn't make this stuff up. You really couldn't. Um, I know that the Big Finish are doing, uh, look, still doing um, a, a lot of work because I've got friends who are um, working with them now on different doctors and that sort of thing. But they're always, business is always booming with the Big Finish. They're always working on lots of different projects. So I know that they're, you know, alive and kicking um whether Dana's coming back I mean I don't know I mean with Paul and um Jacqueline um leaving us I, I don't know whether that's something that they um want to continue with but I mean if they did if they did if I got a call today and it was like yes we want to do this with Dana or with Jabe or or with Jabe's um ancestor uh, <laughs> who's also who, who, who's also part of the franchise I jump at it I jump at anything with the big finish I, of course I of it. course you did Jay yeah. didn't you 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 um did an audio you didn't have to get dressed up for or made up for I didn't I didn't <laughs> not one piece of prosthetic anything was on my face and um, it was delightful but yeah tales from the new forest I think it was called that's probably new newer, newer. newer. New Earth, that's it. Tales from the New Earth. Um, yeah, did that. That that was lots of fun. But, You've done um, some, some Dorian Gray as well. You've you know, been around. Yes, the Abysmal Sea. That was so much fun. That was my first. That was a two-hander, and um, I loved doing that. that. Was tremendous fun. A really good script, and I wasn't. I I'd never listened to it. I didn't. I didn't know. I mean, I'm familiar with. A picture of Dorian Gray, but I didn't know that it was something that Big, the Big Finish were doing or that they were doing it this way. Um, and um, so, you know, I was asked and I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Oh, he's a pretty amazing um, young actor, isn't he? Alexander Vlahos. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what's next for Yasmin Bannerman? Where, what does the future hold for you? What are your hopes and dreams oh. or plans? Yeah, do you know what I'm? You know, I'm I'm at this point where I'm sort of reviewing the situation, and um, yeah, I definitely um, would like to do more voiceover work, and um, I'd I'd love to do some more documentaries. That's one thing that I've always really enjoyed. I've I've, I've done 
know, vote that sort of thing in the past. And that's definitely something I would return to. Would love to work with the big finish some more. You know, I know that when I did The Bride of Peladon, it was such a long time since my, um, between The Bride of Peladon and The Fourth Wall. And, um, and so I am anticipating that at some point in the future, I will get that call because my answer will be yes. I don't care where in the world I, I am. Um, I, I would absolutely come back and do more of that. But um, yeah, I am, I am sort of um, looking at things again. And um, there's some studio work here because I, I always do a bit while I'm in Germany as well. I do work in studio over here, mainly with sort of advertising and that sort of thing. And that's all well and good and happy. Um, but I'd love to try a bit of writing and I'm thinking about doing a bit more of that again because that's something that I used to do and never took very seriously so watch the face you never know um, you talked about the repertoire environment of Doctor Who you, you did one episode that's it we own you um, you know as long as you realize that you know as soon as you've done any Doctor Who we own you from now on and so, <laughs> yeah. yeah just from, yeah project to project that's what, that's what happens next yeah. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely lovely talking to you. Um, I have loved your work. I have loved what you've brought to Big Finish. So thank you so much for your time thank and all you. you've done. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, Tales from New Earth. Once there was a world called New Earth, and some of the people who lived there were humans, some were aliens, and others were cats. And in that world stood New New York. Don't you ever want something different? How do you mean? An escape from New New York. All I want is here. There's so much more to see, Thorne. It's all out there, waiting. I'm telling you, Devon, things are gonna happen. When I was elected to the Senate, I had to take extraordinary measures to make the city habitable and safe again for its new wave of occupants. And that included striking a deal with Lux Incorporated. It's happening again. Cover your eyes. What? Just do it. Do it now. Why are you here? I came to see Thorne's brothers and sisters. Suddenly, a thin man in a stripy suit with a shock of dark hair poked his head out from the house and said, Put the gun away! He didn't do this. His teeth are nowhere near big enough. So, I don't shoot him. I've witnessed trees praying to new gods. The worshippers dancing full of energy. The scorch clearing on the other side of the valley. The light was bright. All hail the Lux. The Lux is coming. Oh, gods, what have they done? Big finish. We love stories. Thanks once again to Yasmin for joining us today on the show. Our recommendations for this week are pretty much everything you've just heard us talking about uh, on the episode. So make sure you sign up for the Big Finish newsletter and you may be able to snag some of these stories on special. And uh, thank you for watching or listening to the show. Next time we're going to be chatting with writer AK Benedict who wrote one of the standout stories of 2021 for Big Finish, The Lost Resort. We'll catch you next week for that one. See you guys. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 86, Crossover Queen, with our special guest Yasmin Bannerman and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and your favourite podcast app. Our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram handles are all at Audio Sirens. And our website is sirensofaudio.com. And the next time you want to follow the adventures of a rebellious weapons expert, need the services of an intergalactic adjudicator, or simply want to spend some time with a tree, just search for Yasmin Bannerman on the Big Finish website. She's got you covered. In the meantime, keep listening to Audio Drama, because Audio Drama...